it had been a hard day. In fact, a hard few days, if not a hard few weeks. Luke tells us in his Gospel in chapter 8 that Jesus went for every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Jesus walked the land mile after mile with little chance to rest. Mark in his Gospel tells us of the, the pressure he was under. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And again in Mark's third chapter, and the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And again later in that same chapter. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. <coughs> and Luke's clear that it wasn't just his friends who were trying to bring him back. Luke records in his eighth chapter, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and they could not come at him for the press. And it's told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. There was no time to stop for Jesus to get away from the crowds. Even his own family thought he was mad to keep up this intensity and wished him to return home. And the day that we're looking at started in much the same way. Again, Mark's Gospel in chapter 4 tells us, And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And so it continued all day until the evening. We went in there, didn't we, in verse 16 of chapter 8 of Matthew. When evening had come, they brought in many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits of the word and healed all who were sick. They might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. That physical intensity of the activity was accompanied by the spiritual and emotional stress of so much suffering and so much distress which Jesus took on for those who came to him. Jesus is not above our human frailties. The writer of a later letter, known as the letter of the Hebrews in the New Testament, tells us, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For though he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succour them that are tempted. And again in Hebrews 4 verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Though he was the Son of God, he was a man with the same physical weaknesses we all had. <coughs> We're told he wept, he was able to feel sorrow, that he became hungry and tired. But he never allowed this to deflect him from his service of God, or to lose patience, or to sin. And at the end of a tiring day, the end of a, end of a tiring week or more, Jesus now did decide it was time to get away. 
And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. But even now, there were two others who demanded his attention. Verse 19. The certain scribe came and said to him, Teach, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here we have a man who wished to follow Jesus, and perhaps Jesus' reply may seem a little harsh. But surely it was a genuine concern that man knew what he was letting himself in for. Jesus would later say to another man who said he would follow him, No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. To follow Jesus was to be no part-time commitment, as the next man then was shown in our reading, verse 21. Then another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. A lack of compassion and care was very far from Jesus' teaching, but apparently it wasn't the time for this now with this man. <coughs> they were in the middle of bringing life to the people, and that was the priority at this moment in time. You can hear the weariness in Jesus' words as, tired of this period of intense work, he told that scribe that the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. Surely he was to fall asleep at the back of a storm-tossed boat, exposed to the elements, and again to be disturbed by the needs of others. Was the scribe ready for such a commitment? That was the concern for Jesus. So there was some doubt over these two men's desire to follow the Lord, but it was not so for the twelve they were willing to follow even as on this occasion into danger verse 23 now when he got into a boat his disciples followed him and this attitude needs to be the case for all followers of Jesus he warned those who would follow him in John 15 remember the word that I said unto you the servant is not greater than his Lord If they've persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Indeed, a little while earlier, Jesus had told them during what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. To follow the Lord was not to be an easy ride. But as we were to see illustrated later on the sea, that should never be a problem for those who trust in him. And so they set sail across the lake. With experienced fishermen like Peter and Andrew on board. But it was not to be all plain sailing. Verse 24. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. This storm was beyond anything that these experienced fishermen could cope with. Matthew there, in that word translated tempest or storm, uses the Greek word that's normally translated earthquake. So perhaps this was a a tsunami in a storm such as these men had never experienced before. And in the tumult of such a storm, they turned to the Lord, who was so tired he remained asleep in the back of the boat. The different gospel writers tell us that they all cried out different things. Some cried, Lord, save us, we perish. Others, Master, Master, we perish. And even some, as Mark records in his Gospel, Master, 
carest thou not that we perish? Does the Lord not care? When we're in trouble, is he oblivious to our sufferings? This was the man on the night he was betrayed said, Greater love of no man than this, to the man lay down his life for his friends. And then he went to floggings, beatings, and crucifixion for all those who would trust in him. So of course he cares. But do we trust in him? When troubles hit us in our life, do we struggle on or even blame God for them? Or do we turn to God and his son and ask for help? When the disciples in the boat turned to Jesus, then we read in verse 26, But he said to them, Why are you fearful of you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. When they turned to the Lord, they were saved. And notice the order of Jesus' words. First to the disciples, then to the winds and the waves. The first priority, the greatest danger, was the disciples' wavering faith. The storms in their heart that made them doubt that the Lord was there and could protect them. That had to then the perils of life. For if we are on the Lord's side, then what can these perils of life do to us? We see here that even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus said again on that night he was betrayed and his disciples scattered. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. As the disciples who see their Lord arrested, beaten and killed, Jesus told them to have peace, to trust in God, and all would be well. And it's the same message for those who would follow the Lord. Just the same thing as we see it was on this night, on this sea. <coughs> the disciples marvelled, or were afraid, as the other Gospel writers say. Luke sums it up when he tells us, they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the and they obey him. This was no conjuring trick, no escape from a seemingly sealed box that we might see some magicians try today. This was not one of the healings that Jesus did that perhaps we would say modern medicine could repeat or faith healers, whether you believe in them or not. This on this, in this storm wax sea was a miracle that no magician or conjurer throughout the years could ever come close to, to control the elements. As Matthew recalls a little later when Jesus walked on the water to a boat and the storm again ceased, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth thou art the Son of God. This was a miracle that tells us that Jesus was the Son of God. John in his Gospel tells us. For many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The miracle shows that Jesus was the Son of God and therefore we can believe in him, trust in him and his Father and we can then have hope of eternal life. Jesus was able to carry out these acts due to the power of God given to him at his baptism. Matthew records in chapter 3. And Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straightway out of the water. And like others who had that Holy Spirit, the power of God given to them, like the disciples sent out to preach, Jesus was given it without measure, because he was God's Son. 
At his baptism we saw that God spoke of his Son, calling him his beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Hear ye him. Jesus is the Son of God, and the miracles he performed tell us that he was. Then we need to listen to him. We saw earlier, didn't we, that his mother and his brothers came to try to take him home. And what did Jesus say on that occasion? My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. We must hear him. Then do our best to carry out that which he asks of us. We'll sing in our closing hymn are some of those things that Jesus asks of us. But we can see from that miracle today, we can see this need to follow him. Yes, with our eyes open to the fact that this might not be an easy road to walk. But trusting implicitly that if we do our best to hear him, then this man, the Son of God, who could control the winds and the waves on that lake, can also control any storm in our lives and rescue us from them when we turn to him. And he says if we do that, then we can have peace and eternal life.